Okay, and uh, hi there, welcome to the third in our series of updated videos looking at fiscal policy. In this session, we're going to focus on the budget deficit. Well, what is a budget deficit? A deficit is when the government spends more money each year on things like education, health and defence than it gets back in tax revenues from things like income tax and VAT. So if the government's running a deficit, it needs to borrow money to cover the difference. And this borrowing is known as the budget or the fiscal deficit. Here's a familiar chart. If you followed our first two videos, it tracks government spending this time in blue and tax revenue in orange. And the gap between the two is the level of the budget deficit. In the financial year from April 2019 to February 2020, government was government was borrowing 44 billion pounds. We know that figure is going to be much bigger in the next year or two. Obviously, as the impact of the coronavirus crisis uh, pans out. One way of measuring the deficit is not necessarily in pounds, but as a share of a country's GDP. I think this gives a better guide to the scale of a fiscal position. And this chart shows it since the mid 1990s. When tax revenues equal government spending in any one year financial year, uh, we say that there is a balanced budget. And can you see from the chart that in 2001, 2002, that was the closest we got to a balanced budget. We had a deficit of just under one half of 1%. In the preceding two years, there was actually a small budget surplus, but contrast that with the deficit in 2009, 2010, shown here in green. Notice how the deficit shot up from 2.9% in 2007 to 10% two years later. That, of course, was the result of the recession, an increase in government spending, uh, the cost of bailing out banks and what have you, and a big fall in tax revenues. Since then, over the last 10 years or so, through fiscal austerity, there has been an attempt to bring down the size of the budget deficit. And the last data was it was less than 2% of GDP. But of course, we now know that figure uh, will, will prove to be a low watermark. The figure will be shooting up in the next year or two. My next question is this one. How does the UK government borrow the money when it's running a budget deficit? And the answer is that it issues bonds. Let's work through the situation. If G is greater than T, if government spending is higher than taxation, then the government will issue new bonds. Bond is a, is a loan, it's an IOU, it's a form, of, a form of debt. Those bonds are sold in the bond market and the Bank of England uh, runs the auction process by which investors uh, make a bid for those bonds. Now bonds have different maturities. Uh, maturity is the date or the year when the bond is repaid to the investor Investors buy bonds. Uh, they can uh, they can be retail investors. You and I, we could buy them. Oftentimes, they are institutional investors, such as pension funds and insurance companies. So investors can be both domestic and external. Uh, those people, those institutions can buy government debt. Now, those bonds pay fixed interest. That's known as the coupon. Uh, and the coupon is fixed, but therefore the yield on a bond, the percentage return on the bond, which is the coupon divided by the market price, that will vary inversely with the price of bonds. I've put together a separate video on YouTube on the link between bond prices and bond yields. Well worth a look. Once a bond has been issued, it's then traded. So it's no different, for example, from a company essentially going to the capital markets and listing and selling shares. Uh, once those shares are, uh, are floated, they become traded. The same is true with, with government bonds. Here's a quick fact file on the UK government bonds. Government bonds, by the way, are also called gilts because they are low risk. While that's true for most countries, the risk of a government being unable to repay debt, of course, is fairly low. Uh, although there are countries such as Greece and Argentina and Zimbabwe, which, of course, have defaulted on some or all of their loans in the past. The Bank of England manages the regular UK debt auctions and redemptions. A redemption is when debt is repaid. And the British government has never failed to make either an interest payment or a repayment on the bonds or the gilts as they fall due. 
About a quarter of UK government debt is actually borrowed for quite a long time. These are called long dated securities, 15 years or more in this case. And just over a quarter of debt is index linked, where the coupon is adjusted for the effects of inflation. UK government tends to borrow long term. The average term to maturity is 17 years, whereas for G7 countries, the average, that's countries such as Canada, United States, France, Germany, uh, the average is seven years. Uh, the UK government therefore tends to borrow long. It issues a high percentage of new debt, a bond, that will mature after 10 to 20 years, perhaps even longer. A debt auction, government debt auction is when the Bank of England issues new debt and investors come to the auction and they bid a price for the debt that is being sold. Now the price set at auction determines their yield because there's an inverse relationship between the market price of a bond and the yield. Here's a good example of the current debt auction timetable to take us through to the middle of March in 2020. Uh, the government goes to the market, uh, Bank of England operates the debt auctions and you'll see here from the dates, for example, that they're issuing some five-year debt, some uh, 30, uh, sorry, 20 year debt, 30 year debt, uh, debts of different maturity. So here's a structure of UK bonds in a nice convenient pie chart. On the left hand side, we have long dated bonds, bonds issued by the government, which will be paid uh, more than 15 years ahead in the future. Index linked bonds, bonds whose interest is linked to inflation. That's a useful hedge against inflation for bond investors who might be looking to for their bonds to maintain the real value, hence the, in the index linked. And on the right hand side, shorter dated bonds, including treasury bills, uh, bonds, for example, with less than three years before they get repaid. And it's up to the government to think about the term structure of the interest of the bonds they uh, that they issue. They don't want to go too long. Uh, that will be a hostage to fortune for a future generation. But if they borrow for too short a length of time, then there's no guarantee necessarily that the economy will be in a good shape to be able to repay all of that debt. What is a yield curve? This is a little bit of a bonus section in the video. A yield curve, and here's the yield curve for the UK. A yield curve is a, is a curve, which uh, and it plots uh, the yields or the interest rates of bonds having equal credit quality but different maturity dates ranging from left to right, uh, from one to three years, right across to 20, 30, 40 years and more. And the y-axis, uh, that is the average yield on those bonds. Now, normally, a yield curve slopes upwards because if you're going to borrow uh, money, and think about it from the lender's point of view, you're going to lend money to the government for a long time, 10, 15, 20 years, then the risk is a little higher, particularly the risk of default, and perhaps the risk of inflation. So typically the interest rates are higher for bonds of long maturity to reward investors who are sacrificing liquidity for a lengthy period of time. However, look at uh, September 2019 in the UK. The yield curve actually was sloping downwards a little bit, uh, particularly towards the bonds issued on a five-year maturity date. Now, an inverted yield curve which slopes downwards goes against the conventional view and is oftentimes seen as a sign of possible recession. In particular, it may be the case that uh, bond investors think there might be some deflation, uh, in which case the real uh, price of a bond will go up and that will drive the yield down. Since uh, this picture was taken, since from, sorry, from September through to December 2019, the UK yield curve resumed its normal-ish shape. Once you head 35, 40 years into the future, uh, I'm not really too worried about that. How much does it cost the government to borrow? So we know that the UK government is borrowing hundreds of millions of pounds every week. Well, the cost of the borrowing is given by the yield or the interest rate on a bond. And take a look at this chart, which shows the, uh, the yield uh, on a long-term 10-year government bond for the UK, all the way from the 1960s through to the current time period, uh, March 2020. Can you see, for example, in the 1970s and the 1980s, long time ago now, but the yield on a bond was really high. It was more than 10%. So investors were demanding very high yields if they were going to lend the British government money. Those were decades of high and volatile inflation where there was a significant risk premium attached to lending to the government. 
Over the last 25 years or so, the yield on government bonds has come down. All kinds of reasons for this, including a global glut of savings and a much lower average rate of inflation in the UK economy. But what it does mean is that if you look at the fall in yields over this period, they've now reached historic lows. The British government can borrow for 10 years at somewhere between one half and one percent. Now that is very low and in a sense gives the government an opportunity to borrow money either because it needs to in response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic or because it wants to. Perhaps it wants to borrow money to fund key infrastructure projects such as HS2, HS3, Crossrail 2 and other big lumpy projects. The question is, will these yields stay very low? How much further might yields go up if the government has to borrow more money? So there we go, a quick look at the budget deficit. We've covered the deficit, how the government borrows money. We've, do, we've looked at the bond markets, the yield curve, and uh, hopefully that was a, an interesting look at a key part of fiscal policy.